just to recap AstroCon, it's been an absolutely wonderful event. I think it's been a very productive event for the developers that have been here. We had what I felt was an absolutely great AstroDevCon where we talked a lot about the future of Asterisk and where we can take Asterisk as a platform to build stable, reliable communications applications. Um, so uh, we'll get a little bit more into that, but we are going to uh, discuss the state of Asterisk, uh, in particular Asterisk 11, which is soon to be released. It's a long-term su uh, support release, so it's uh, unlike 10, which had a year of bug fixes, which will end in December, if I recall correctly followed by a year of security fixes. This is the same kind of release as 1.8. It's going to be supported for a very long time. Um, and we're really, really excited about the things that have gone into that. Um, Asterisk 11 really kind of got enhancements in a really, you can kind of say, three broad areas of classification. Um, we had a lot of enhancements that came from the Asterisk developer community that helped out to the user experience, the people who actually have to administer Asterisk and build things on top of Asterisk. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of those. Um, we also built on the success of Asterisk 10. We took a lot of the core architectural changes that had been made during that version and extended on them and built on them to help out uh, the capabilities that people had already begun deploying Asterisk in certain kinds of situations. And last but not least, which I'm certain you all are aware of, uh, we have some really cool cutting edge new features uh, such as WebRTC. Thank you, Mr. Joshua Colt. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, I do want to mention in Astro DevCon, uh, we looked uh, the, the room, we had about 45 developers, I think, in the room, um, which is a great turnout, and we had some long time contributors to Asterisk uh, who were able to actually fly in and make the Astro DevCon. Alec Davis from New Zealand, special thanks, thank you, because I know that was an incredibly long flight. Um, <laughs> there you are, I was looking for you. Um, <laughs> Really, we began, I think, the process of establishing goals for Asterisk 12, where we actually really want to take the product. And that kind of fell into two broad classifications. Um, on the one hand, we definitely want to spend a lot of time in the SIP channel driver, make it more maintainable, make it more extensible, make it so that people can build uh, applications that use the SIP protocol and get access to that and know that they're not going to impact other areas of SIP functionality. We also want to focus a lot on the APIs that Asterisk exposes, so AMI, AGI, make those robust, make them stable, make them make it so that you can build applications on top of Asterisk in a fast, efficient manner and be able to take those applications from version to version and not worry about major breaking changes that require you to retool your entire application. So uh, before we go any further into new features, I want to thank a lot of the Asterisk community. This, this is not a complete list of everybody who actually contributed to Asterisk in the past year. These are all people who contributed to Asterisk 11. Um, everything from new features to bug fixes to just helping us out and making this the version that it is. And Asterisk really is the product that it is because of the community. Um, and like I said, we had over 100 contributors. I really just copy and pasted a bunch of names in here, and if I missed you and you're not on here and you contributed, I'm sorry, you can come beat me up afterwards, but again, um, if people, in, sorry, I know some of y'all in the room here, just if everybody can give them a round of applause, we're really <laughs> um, So, um, as I was mentioning, one of the big areas uh, that people helped contribute to and helped build Asterisk for Asterisk 11 was really focusing on the end user experience. So one of the things we actually started doing, finally, is documenting the AMI events. Uh, <laughs> so we didn't get them all, because there's a lot of them, but we really tried to get the core ones, the ones that you're probably going to see the most of. Um, and so if you go, you do have to do a special, and I think uh, Matt actually demoed this during his talk, you do have to do a, it required some tweaking to the automatic uh, documentation generation in the Asterisk build system. So if you make full, not a make, but a make full, you'll get the, you'll get the event documentation. Um, and that uh, is already up on the Asterisk wiki, and it, you'll have CLI commands that'll let you query for those manager events. It actually aggregates the events across the system, so if you have events of the same type in multiple files, it actually groups them together. It'll show you the fields that are optional. It'll give you a little bit of information about why, when the events should be raised, right? So if I get a dial event, that happens both at the beginning of the dial and when the dial finishes. It actually shows you that there's slight differences between those events. Um, we've got a lot more work to do in that area. If anybody would like to contribute some documentation patches to ask us to help us get those, that would be much appreciated. Um, call ID logging. 
Um, is Claude in the room still? Hey, Claude. So Claude is the originator of this idea, and we took that idea and uh, kind of extended it a little bit, but didn't quite get everywhere that Claude had originally applied it to. So there's really cool things that Claude had thought of that I'm hopeful we'll actually build in future versions of Aster. So what is call ID logging? And I think this is one of those features that you really have to look at to really fully appreciate just how useful it is. Um, so here's a traditional asterisk uh, message log, and you can see I've got some local channels, and they're doing some things, and there's a bunch of local channels, and I, maybe I really wanted to just focus in on a single channel and what it was actually doing in asterisk, and that's kind of hard. You know, you've got the thread IDs there, but multiple threads can affect a single channel, and so now maybe I need to get information from one thread as opposed to another. So traditionally in asterisk, on a, particularly on very busy systems, this can be a whole lot of gleaning information and tying it together manually. This is what that same log looks like on asterisk 11. And you'll note that there's an extra field there, which is a call ID. And a call ID is attached to a channel when it's first created and it follows the channel around. And the call ID can persist across multiple channels. So as calls get tied together, they <coughs> tend to actually stick around. So let's say I cared about call ID number nine. Well, using, and we didn't do anything fancy here, we just used grep. You actually get everything that call nine did. So this should really help out system administrators make it easier to find problems when things actually go wrong. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about pre-down handlers? Sure. Um, generally, you want to do things to a channel, maybe set some variables here and there before the channels actually get dialed. Um, so, Right now, you've got, <laughs> it is somewhat self-explanatory, maybe, but, it, but there's some really cool applications here. So Mark, um, is Mark in the room right now? Go guys, hey. Um, so uh, Mark came up with this idea and contributed the initial code, and it's a really cool feature, particularly in parallel dial situations, because what it lets you do, so currently everybody's aware you've got the interception macro and routine that you can execute on a channel during a dial that happens after the dial, but before the bridge. So this is kind of even before then, right? You, these subroutines get executed immediately after the channel was created, but before any dialing takes place. So if you need to go set CDR information, if you need to go uh, look at what actual channels are going to, if you want to plot logic before asterisk has any chance to go do anything with those channels, you get the opportunity to do so. And as we're going to find out a little bit later, this actually this feature is really cool because it actually enabled other features that went into asterisk 11. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get there. Costco camp. Th this one I know is near and dear to your heart, because you did it. <laughs> right. Um, so there was this thing called zip calls a long time ago. It's been sitting around in Asterisk for a while. It has some issues performance-wise. Uh, it uses the master dial, master dial time function, or, or master channel dial time function, and that just kind of has to lock the entire set of channels and run through that, um, which can hang up the rest of the system for a little bit here and there. But when you're using a lot, it's uh, a little bit rough. So what this does is it uh, provides a nice replacement for that, and it, you can actually get uh, the technology specific and the independent cost codes for each channel that's dialed in a parallel dial or, or even uh, a branching dial through local channels. So a lot of people will, will uh, they like to get the SIP cost code specifically and the, uh, the, the type of messages that are coming in, and this allows that without having to uh, hang up the system. Yeah, and it also gives some interesting flexibility in the sense that um, I know a lot of people will sometimes complain to us because they think that asterisk is sending an incorrect uh, response code when a dial fails. And if you have the flexibility of seeing how every channel responded in a dial, then you have the ability yourself to set a hang up cause and so that when you call the hang up application, you can send exactly what it is you want back to the, uh, the calling side. So, moving kind of along the same sort of um, construction, this is sort of the analog to construction when you've got destruction of the channel. So, as pre-dial lets you affect the channel right when it's being built, hang-up handlers let you affect the channel when it's being disposed of. And basically, these are very similar to an H extension, right? Except that unlike an H extension, it doesn't really matter where the channel is, the subroutine still gets executed, right? So, if you define an H extension in a particular context, then you 
put that channel at some other point in time into a different context and hung up and your H extension that you executed and you previously had to do some valve plan kind of includes in order to get all that stuff to work properly. This lets you actually push a subroutine directly and attach it to the channel. So no matter where that channel goes, when that channel hangs up, that code gets executed. You can even do some things where you can actually push multiple handlers onto a channel. So say you've got some hang up cause information that you want to go get when that channel hangs up in one particular place, but then you actually send the channel off someplace else, you can keep on attaching hang-up handlers, and they execute like a little stack. They'll unwind themselves as they pull themselves off the channel. And again, everybody thank Mark after the uh, show, because this is another one of his ideas. So very cool, very cool feature. So as I was kind of saying, this, this one's real interesting, because this gets into uh, kind of an aspect of Asterisk that is real specific to a use case, but it has got some real awesome flexibility for being able to control party identification. Um, so uh, Gunther Kelder and Thomas Aramont came up with this. This was, And this really uses pre-dial, actually, in order to accomplish its objective. And the best way I can explain this is, say Kinsey wants to dial both Josh and Mark, OK? but. When he dials Josh, he wants to be known as Kinsey. When he dials Mark, he wants to go by his handle of Opticron. So now, that in order to do that currently, you might have to do some interesting sort of dialing information. You might have to do a lot of inspection on the channels, and it's kind of hard to do. Instead, what you can do is Kinsey could actually set private identification on his channel to being Opticron, and public identification as Kinsey for Josh. And when the parallel dial happens, the pre-dial can pick, oh, hey, I'm dialing Mark. Send the private stuff. Or, oh, Dave, or oh, I'm Alan Josh, send the public stuff. So you've got some really fine-grained control over how you represent your calls to various parties, and you can execute some very interesting business logic in your dial plan. 